The World Tomorrow. The Worldwide Church of God presents Herbert W. Armstrong, bringing you the plain truth about today's world news and the prophecies of the world tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Herbert W. Armstrong. I wonder if you realize, my friends, that mysteries, mysteries of God that have been hidden, that have been locked until now, are being revealed today. The prophet Daniel was used to write one of the greatest prophetic books of all time, but he didn't understand what he wrote. The angel appeared before Daniel and said, Go thy way, Daniel. The words are closed and sealed until the time of the end. At this time when many will be running to and fro, and knowledge will be increased. And then the wise were to understand, but none of the wicked would understand. Well, now there's a Bible definition of what constitutes the wicked and what constitutes the wise. The wicked are simply those that are sinning, and all have sinned, but sin in your Bible is the transgression of the law of God. And again, you find the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the eternal. The fear of the Lord, the fear of the eternal, is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. And there you are. Have you ever noticed how Jesus said to his disciples that many of the prophets of old had desired to know the things that he was teaching them, that they had searched diligently to know those things, but they could never know them, even though they were, as Peter said, holy men of old that were moved and inspired by the Holy Spirit in the writing of the Word of God. And even though they were holy men, and even though they had the Spirit of God and were inspired in the writing of the Holy Scriptures, very often they did not understand what they wrote. Now, knowledge has been revealed progressively. In the days of Christ, some were able to know some of the things that had not been known 500, 600, 1,000 years before. But, my friends, in our day, many things are being opened up and revealed that were not known even in the days of Christ. This is the time of the end. And the words of Daniel, for instance, were closed and sealed until the time of the end. Now, we find that God had locked up these prophecies, but there are certain keys that unlock the doors. And if you have those keys, you can begin to understand. And without those keys, you cannot understand. That's all there is to it. A good understanding have they that do his commandments. That's another reason why so many do not understand today. People want to plead the blood of Christ. People want to believe in a dead Christ. But they do not want to obey God. Now, the only reason Christ had to die was because we've been disobeying God. And he died to reconcile you to God so that Your sins no longer cut you off from God, because our sins cut us off from God. And once we're reconciled to God, then through the life of Jesus Christ, through his resurrection, we can receive the very life of God. And salvation comes through the life of God, and through the life, the resurrection of Christ. That's made possible by his death. And so his death makes it possible for us to receive the Spirit of God, which is the love of God shed abroad in our hearts, the love that fulfills the law and makes it possible for us to be obedient. And when that love comes from God that fulfills his law, then you have the very righteousness of God. Then you become like God because you're living like God, you're thinking like God. And that, my friends, will lead to the development that will bring you salvation. Now, one of the mysteries of the Bible that very few have ever understood, is the identity of this mysterious man, Melchizedek. Who is or who was Melchizedek? We've been going through this wonderful but little understood and little read book, Hebrews, the priesthood book that tells about the job that Christ is doing right now. Jesus Christ has a very high office. He has a mission, a job, a profession, a high office. And he is laboring there. He doesn't sleep, you know. He's not physical. He's not human. He has been made divine. He has been made God. 
He was made flesh and dwelt among us. But now he has been made God. He is born a son of God by a resurrection from the dead, as you read in the first chapter of Romans. And he's the firstborn of many brethren. And he's at the right hand of God the Father, sitting on his Father's throne. He isn't yet sitting on his own throne. He's sitting on the Father's throne, and he's there as your high priest to minister for you and to see that if you conform to the terms and conditions, which are very simple, that you repent, that you obey, and that you believe. And he's there to see that your prayers get answered. And there's a reason why they aren't answered. One reason is you don't repent, you don't obey. And another reason is that you don't come boldly to that throne of grace, that you can find help, grace to help in the time of need. No, you neglect this great salvation, and it means a whole lot. It's a very practical thing in your everyday life to deliver you out of all your problems and troubles, to give you wisdom, to help you along. Yes, even give you the breaks and see that things work out right for you. Well, in this sixth chapter of Hebrews, we had come down to the place where we read about Christ having entered within the veil, in other words, into the very throne of God up in heaven, whither the forerunner is for us entered even Jesus, that is, the very throne of God, made a high priest forever after the order, or of the same rank as Melchizedek. Because that's what it means. Now, who is this Melchizedek? Now, first, Melchizedek was God's high priest. It was way back in the time of Abraham. He had always been a high priest, but we only find matter recorded during the time of Abraham. Now, incidentally, there's a little something. Let me stop and explain In the Bible, there were many, many, many centuries prior to Abraham, but you don't read very much in the Bible before Abraham. You begin to find Abraham introduced here in the 12th chapter. Well, he's introduced first in the 11th chapter in his genealogy. And these first 11 chapters of the Bible cover a great long period of time. But not very much is revealed to us about that time. Very little is revealed to us about what happened back before the flood. Of course, the flood is something that's very fashionable today to laugh at and sneer about. I wonder if you realize that uh, if our geologists would just wake up and be willing to confess any of their errors and re-look for the truth that there is ample evidence in geology and in the rock strata of the earth that proves there was a flood. But, of course, since they decided there wasn't a flood, they can't admit that kind of evidence. Well, I can produce evidence that geologists cannot refute. Of course, they can laugh, they can sneer, they can jeer, they can turn and run the other way, but they can't refute it. And, of course, when you can't refute anything and you're unwilling to admit it, there's too much human pride to ever admit we've been wrong, isn't there? The way to get around the thing is just to sneer at it and ridicule it. That makes other people think it's insignificant and it isn't true. That's the way to get around truth and get away from it if you don't want to accept truth. There's a lot of that going on in this world. Well, there's very little back here in these first chapters. In other words, God reveals very little of the history of what happened in that time, and there are no profane records of history about it at all. A lot of men not knowing anything about it, not having any historic record, add a good many thousands or millions of years that they think went on there. There's no evidence. There's no proof. They've never given you any proof. You've never seen any proof. Of course, because learned men look dignified and maybe grow a beard to look very dignified and pronounce that they're scientists and tell you that a certain thing happened, and most of you, just like a lot of dumb sheep, just believe it and follow it and swallow whatever they want to tell you, hook, line, and sinker. God's Word says, prove all things. You ever stop to prove some of these things? You're going to get your eyes opened when you do. Well, there isn't very much given about anything till you come to the time of Abraham, of what happened. Very, very little. And the prophecy is merely history written in advance. And when we get up to the time of the coming of Christ, there is very little written about what's going to happen way off there in advance, in the future, that hasn't come yet. You'll have to remember, my friends, that the Bible is peculiarly the book of Israel and about Israel. And Abraham is the father of Israel. Abraham is also the father of the faithful. 
And if you don't become an Israelite, you have no salvation. A Gentile is without God, without hope, without Christ, and without any salvation. He's cut off from salvation. But through repentance and through Christ, he's pictured as a branch on a wild olive tree, and he can be cut right off of his nationality or his wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature onto the natural olive tree, which is Israel. You read of that in the 11th chapter of Romans. Now, the Bible is the book of Israel. And although salvation is opened up to Gentiles spiritually, they become Israelites through Christ. And they become Abraham's children. If ye be Christ, said Paul to the Gentiles at Galatia, then are you Abraham's children and heirs, according to the promise, made to Abraham. So the first you find about this Melchizedek was in the time of Abraham. Now, he had been a priest prior to that time. But as I say, we don't find much recorded about what happened before that time. So he was God's priest. Now, it was during a war between a number of ancient city-states. Abraham's nephew, Lot, had been captured. He and his family and his goods carried off. One of their number escaped, came and told Abraham. Abraham armed 318 of his own soldiers. They pursued them clear up to the northern part of Palestine, clear beyond Dan. And they rescued Lot and his family. They returned with them and their goods, and incidentally with a lot of spoil, because... In those days, and even yet, except America and perhaps Britain, uh, whenever you win a war, you take the spoil. In other words, you just loot and rob the people you've conquered of whatever they have, whatever you want. And even Abraham apparently did that. And it says here in Genesis 14, beginning with verse 18, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Now, this was before the Levitical priesthood. This was more than 400 years before the time of Moses. And he blessed him, Abraham, and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. That is, God is the possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he, Abraham, gave unto him, Melchizedek, tithes, that is, ten percent of all. Now, notice Melchizedek was the king of Salem. Salem is the original Jerusalem. It now is called Jerusalem, but that's just Jeru, Salem. They prefix Jeru on the front of it, and they call it Jerusalem now. Now, Hebrew words have meaning. The meaning of the name Melchizedek is king of righteousness. Now, if we would translate that Hebrew word into English, we wouldn't say Melchizedek. We'd say king of righteousness, and that would be his name. And Salem means peace, or Jerusalem means peace. It's the city of peace. Only it hasn't known peace because of the ways of mankind, but it will yet know peace forever. So this Melchizedek, whose name was King of Righteousness, was King of Peace. Why? The King of Righteousness would also be King of Peace, because righteousness produces peace. Righteousness is the way to peace. It's unrighteousness that provokes and produces war, my friends. So naturally, he was the king of peace, and he was the king then of the town called Salem that became the city of Jerusalem. And it is stated that he was the priest of the Most High God. Now, Melchizedek is mentioned again in Psalms 110, verse 4, and that is quoted in Hebrews 5, 6, and 7, The Eternal hath sworn and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, or of the rank of Melchizedek. Now coming to Hebrews 7, beginning with the 7th chapter of Hebrews again. For this Melchizedek, the king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, that is to Melchizedek, Abraham apportioned the tenth part of everything. He is, that is Melchizedek, is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. Now, that's in your Bible. The King James has it a little different wording. First being by interpretation, king of righteousness. That's the interpretation of the Hebrew word, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. Now, since God names people or things what they are, that was his name, king of righteousness. Now, I want you to pause and think of that just a moment. 
king of righteousness. Jesus said, There is none good but one, that is God. And we find that human self-righteousness before God is nothing but filthy rags. None can be righteous but God. Or one who has been made righteous by God's power, you can be made righteous if you will yield and surrender to God and have faith. Faith in Christ. And also faith in God, for that matter. Until Christ is in you, you can be made righteous. Now, certainly none but one of the Godhead could be called king of righteousness. The king of righteousness is the one who is uh, the head of it and the one who rules over righteousness. Such an expression applied to any but God would be blasphemy. No human being could be king of righteousness because all human beings have sinned, and therefore, my friends, you begin to see immediately that Melchizedek was not and could not have been human because his very name was King of Righteousness. And that's no name that God could ever apply to any human being. Now I want you to notice, too, that this man was King of Peace, naturally. Salem, from which Jerusalem was named, means peace. Remember that Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. He is coming as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, but also as the Prince of Peace. But here's a man called the King of Peace. Now, that's certainly a title equal with that of Christ. And Christ is God, very God. He has been made God by a resurrection from the dead. Now, I want you to notice further in verse 3. Melchizedek was, in the King James, without father, without mother, without descent. And in the Revised Version, he is without father or mother or genealogy, and has neither beginning of days nor end of life, there never is a time when his life began, because it has always been. He is from eternity to eternity, just like Christ and just like God the Father. Now, we know that God is a person. We know that Christ is a different person. While Christ was on earth, the Father was up in heaven. And Jesus prayed to the Father. Jesus is a person. He was a self. He said, Of myself I can do nothing. The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Jesus said, The Father that sent me gave him a commandment what to say and to speak. They were two different persons. Now, here is Melchizedek. Back in the beginning of your Bible, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, what is the Hebrew word there for God? The Hebrew word was Elohim. And it means the Almighty, the Ever-Living. It means the Supreme One. But Elohim, my friends, is in a plural, a plural number. It's plural, and it is a word similar to a word like family, as I've explained so many times, a word like church. Now, you read about the church. It is one church, not two churches, not five churches, not hundreds of churches. One church, one body of Christ, but many members. Many members, but the one church. And that one church infused with and led by the one Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, yet many members. Your human body, one body, but many members. You have or should have ten fingers, ten toes, two eyes, a mouth and a nose, two ears. Hope that we all have all of those because they're very important. And so, my friends, God is really a family or a kingdom of persons. Now, here is one of the persons of the very Godhead, this Melchizedek. That's becoming more and more plain as we look into it. King of righteousness. Think of that. Also, king of peace. Now, notice, without father, without mother, without descent. He was never born like humans are. He had no descent from another. He is self-existent, has always existed. Of course, your mind can't contain that. Now, your mind can't imagine anyone that never came into existence. But if he had to come into existence, what power, what force, what person brought him into existence? Your mind can't conceive that either, can it? You just have to admit your mind can't go that far. It goes clear to eternity. Think of it. God has always existed. My mind won't quite grasp that. I don't think yours will either. God always will exist, and you, my friends, too, can have eternal life.
and live forever and ever from this time on. The only difference is there's a time when you and I began to exist, and there was a time prior to that when you and I did not exist. But there has never been a time when God did not exist, and there has never been a time when this Melchizedek did not exist. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life, therefore he has always existed from eternity to eternity. Now, he wasn't created like angels. Angels are created beings, and there was a time when no angel ever existed. Then there was a time when they came into existence when God created them. But here is not an angel. Here is someone very superior to an angel. Yet Melchizedek cannot be God the Father, because he was a priest of the Most High God. Now, Scripture says no man has ever seen the Father. But Abraham saw Melchizedek, saw him and talked with him. So he can't be God the Father. Now, we also read here in this third verse, let me read it to you, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. Not the Father, but made like unto the Son of God. Now, here in the Revised Version, but resembling the Son of God, he continues, that's present tense, a priest forever. He has always existed. Now, he is now a priest. He continues high priest. Yes, Melchizedek continues high priest right now. Now, uh, we're coming to a little more. There's only one high priest. There can't be two high priests one higher than the other. That would be like the movie that Charlie Chaplin made here a good many years ago. If you remember, I think it was called The Dictator, and he uh, had uh, Hitler and uh, Mussolini there. And let me see, he acted the part of Hitler, didn't he? I forget who acted the part of Mussolini. Anyhow, uh, they got into a barb shop, and there were two chairs in the barber shop. And one of them, I don't remember which, he... Uh, he sort of jacked the chair up, you know, how you can a barber chair. To make it a little higher, he wanted to be a little higher than the other. Well, I think probably Mussolini did that, and Hitler wasn't going to stand for it. He was going to be on top of Mussolini, so he jacked his chair up a little higher. And they kept going. Of course, these trick barber chairs in the movie scene kept going till they hit the ceiling. And, of course, we all screamed with laughter. It was so true to nature anyway, how those men had so much egotism. Each one wanted to be higher than the other. Well, now, if you had two high priests, my friends, that's probably about what would happen. Which one's going to be the highest? <laughs> and they each try to get higher than the other. No, there's only one high priest. Because there's no confusion in God's kingdom. Like, it was funny to look at, of course, in a crazy slapstick comedy of the kind. But there's only one high priest. Now, this says that he abides that is, he remains, continues, permanently, continuously, the priest and a high priest, because he wasn't any low priest. God the Father is not the priest of God, but Christ the Son is. And yet in the days when the Apostle Paul lived and wrote, shortly after Jesus had ascended to heaven, Jesus became our high priest. And Scripture states that even then Melchizedek abideth and this was long after Christ had become high priest, and here the Apostle Paul is writing that Melchizedek remains still and is now high priest, because that's what that word abideth means. Does now abide a priest continually. And the Moffat translation says continues to be priest permanently. And this other revised translation continues a priest forever. Now, they all mean they're different words there, but different translations, they all mean the same thing. And so Melchizedek is still the high priest today and will be forever. And at the same time, Christ then is today and shall be forever high priest, same rank. My friends, it begins to become unavoidable that they are one and the same person. Are there two high priests? Why, it's impossible. The conclusion, then, is inescapable. Contrary to many a cherished man-thought idea, and men have ideas. Now, a lot of people that have had a pet idea, they love their idea. They wouldn't give it up, not for anything in the world. No, they may face the choice of giving up their pet idea about something like this, or giving up their life for eternity. But they'll give up their life before they'll give up an idea that they treasure. 
They'll write in and tell me that I'm ignorant, that I'm wrong, that I don't understand. But they'll never admit that they're wrong. It reminds me, you know, of the man that was drunk. And someone told him he's drunk. And he hicked a little bit and said, I know it, so am I. In other words, uh, he thought the other fellow was too. And uh, they usually think it's the other fellow. They can't turn that looking glass around and look into it and see who the one is that's really wrong. I tell you, my friends, human beings seem to get everything twisted and everything upside down until they think black is white, they think east is west, they think that right is wrong. And they seem to think the wrong is all right. Yes, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. The ends thereof are the ways of death. Now, I say, my friends, don't believe men. I don't ask you to believe me. I ask you to open your Bible and believe what you see there. And if you'll yield your mind and your heart to God, he will show you the way. Now I want you to continue in verse 4 where it says here, Now consider how great this man was. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. My friends, do you know what worship is? If you worship anything or anybody except God, that is a capital sin. And let me tell you right here, very few people know what worship is. Most of you people are worshiping things or people other than God, and you're sinning, and you don't know it, because you don't know what constitutes worship. Now, a Bible definition of worship is in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 4. And here it's speaking about the beast, which is the Roman Empire, and as it's to be resurrected. And it says how people here are worshiping the beast. And it says that they will worship the beast. How do they worship? Saying, who is like unto the Roman Empire? Who is like unto this beast? Who is able to make war with it? Now, my friends, a certain amount of the right kind of patriotism is a good thing. Patriotism, if it is worship, is all wrong. But patriotism, if it is mere loyalty, is all right. Oh, my time is up. I didn't realize it. Well, anyhow, that is worship. And here the Bible actually pays worship to this Melchizedek. And so he is greater than any archangel. He is Christ. I'll just have to bring it to a close. Today we live in a time of social unrest, political breakdown, and economic collapse. Piece by piece, our world is falling apart. How can we cope with these crises? Let's face it, many feel we should look to God to make it in today's world. But even though we may already be seeking His help, we often lack the faith needed to receive answers to our prayers. Why? Mainly due to a lack of understanding of what true faith is. Now you can have the real living faith that provides true peace of mind in these turbulent times. The free booklet, What is Faith? answers these vital questions. Exactly what is faith? How do you receive it? And how do you keep growing in that faith? Request your free copy of What is Faith? today. You have heard The World Tomorrow with Herbert W. Armstrong, sponsored by the Worldwide Church of God. For the free literature offered on this program, Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.